Jamie Harwell and Gareth Navin are two names etched into history for their exploits in the Perth Glory side that pulled WA to the apex of the Australian football landscape for the first time in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Two decades after they first forged a friendship on the turf of the old Perth Oval, both have reconnected as elite coaches at State Federation Football West, where Harmwell as Head of Development and Navin as the newly appointed Youth Development Officer are charting pathways for WA's future stars. I'm your host, Josh Chyatt, and in the first episode of Football West's The Western End Podcast, Harmwell and Navin talk about their rise into professional ranks, coaching philosophies, and reminisce about their roles in the most memorable game in Australian domestic soccer history, the unforgettable 2000 NSL Grand Final. Welcome, Gareth, uh, and welcome, Jamie. Gareth, you've just returned to Western Australia after a stint with the Melbourne Victory Youth League team. I'm sure you would have been expecting to do something uh, a little bit different now rather than be working and thinking about football from home. What would you be doing right now uh, under normal circumstances? Well, in regards to to football here at uh, Football West... um... You know, getting on with uh, making players better, um, making coaches better, and obviously making you know, Western Australian football better. Um, a little bit different for me, uh, working at uh, at a member federation level, but at the same time, really important opportunity to um, affect the game and affect players. So, yeah, um, be nice if we could do that on the pitch. Um, in saying that, it's challenging remotely, um, and everyone's working really, really hard in the organisation uh, to keep football in everyone's minds and uh, and thinking about what's next for us. So, uh, yeah, it's a nice challenge. So if you can put your mind back a little bit, take us back to the early to mid-1980s. You're coming up in the game in Western Australia at Bayswater Inter at the time, uh, pretty much hand-in-hand hand with your twin brother, I just saw, a great photo from uh, the front of the Junior Soccer of WA, uh, Junior Soccer WA uh, annual report of yourself and Craig back in 1983, the Dynamos from the West. What was different about junior development back when you were coming up then compared to what it's like now? It was probably as a young bloke in regard, and what I mean by young, when I first started soccer at, you know, uh, six years old at Gospel City, uh, we, we trained twice a week, you know, we went down and had fun. I think more importantly ac- across that as a young um, as young kid is that uh, we uh, we did a lot of sports, you know. It was quite seasonal back then in regards to, now whether it was uh, development in a structured way, but very much unstructured way in regards to multi-sport development at that age. Uh, I used to do a lot of little athletics for a long period of time. Um, and and obviously soccer, so soccer was winter, summer was little athletics. And in saying that as well, there was a lot of school sport we're involved in from from cricket to um, AFL uh, inside the school, to soccer inside the school, so to even water polo. Um, so there was a lot of multi-sports happening at, at very young ages during my primary school years. Um, until, until, you know, 12 or 13, where I, I started to, more focused towards uh, um, soccer. So I think that helped me in a way, the multi-sports in regards to your coordination, um, um, you know, your movement. Uh, So at a very young age, we were open to a lot of different sports. Um, So I think that in the long term, it benefited us a lot. And a lot of the time back then, you were always outdoors um, doing something. Um, in some capacity, uh, a lot of time during the holidays spent sort of playing uh, with your mates um, in the backyard, um, which is not so maybe normal these days. And obviously, we're, we're trying to move towards more more activity um, in different forms. And I, at a very younger age, um, I really believe that it definitely helped me in um, 
moving towards um, and helping me in, in my football, definitely. From there, you were in uh, sort of Australian youth setups uh, along with your brother and you moved into the AIS, which uh, the soccer program there isn't around anymore, but it was such a huge feature of Australian youth development uh, from the mid-1980s into the early 90s. How did you find your time at the AIS and how it shaped you as a player? Yeah, the influence the AIS had me was was quite profound in regards to um, a few things. The, the coaches that we had there, um, Ron Smith and Jimmy Shoulder, the players that we had there in regards to um, the, the best of the best players with very much similar mindset in regards to um, their motivation, the, their wanting to be uh, the best, um, ambitious. Um, so those sort of things were sort of innate in regards to the, the players that I experienced and um, played with at the AIS um, and was a really important stepping stone to um, to have the experience to, to be full-time in football at, at such a young age. Um, and obviously, um, other than that, it developed my knowledge of the game and um, had has had a major influence in, in regards to as a player from, from that age to senior and also um, now as a coach, um, those sort of behaviours or habits that were established me as a player um, probably come through in my coaching as well um, today. To you, what really got burnt in your mind while you were at the AIS? Look, uh, it influences you, I think, in a, in a very good way to understand the game, you know. And as a player, you start to question and start to think about the game more in regards to the knowledge that the coach presents you, um, your teammates present you, um, how competitive it is at that age. Um, so, um, look, and I, I loved it. Um, it wasn't hard for me to um, to say no to that, you know, so it was really easy to say yes. Who were some of the best players that you came up against and, and trained and lived with while you were at the college? Look at AI. So I, I um, look in in my time there. There's there's been a uh, um, a lot of players that um, come into the program with uh, exceptional strengths, and what the AI's program is just heightens those strengths um, in regards to um, your perception, how you make quick decisions, how you use your technique, and you know, um, and some of the players that that were through those programs were were Paul Trimboli. Um, you know, there was um, other players that that may have not have progressed, but their ability to be in the program were was of, of very very high quality. That um, you know, Craig Foster was there, Alice Ebb was there, um, David Clarkson, um, many players that pushed on to have. Um, NSL careers, national team careers. It, it definitely produced a lot of players um, with different strengths and different qualities um, in regards to their, their abilities, definitely. Jamie, you had a, a bit of a different um, introduction to elite level soccer. You maybe didn't make the sort of national teams at, at a young age, but came into the game through the state league level. Yeah, I didn't make national teams at any age, unfortunately, um, which was always a dream. But yeah, I had a, had a much different career path, I suppose. Um, you know, the, the start of it was exactly the same as what Nazi is talking about in terms of, you know, playing all sports, of being outdoors, of being active. Um, you know, my, my Saturday afternoons were taken up by going with my brother to watch my dad play and, and kicking a ball around for five or six hours um, while he played and, and had a beer afterwards. So there's just so much learning that went on unconsciously um, because because you wanted to win regardless if it was a kickabout with your mates or as a 11 v 11 on a, on a Sunday morning. So, you know, I, I never really achieved great heights, I suppose, as a, as a teenager. Um, I was pretty small. For my age, um, I was was pretty slow, um, and it probably wasn't until 
I was 15 or 16 at some some so it didn't change <laughs> that I was very slow anyway. Um, but yeah, about 15, 16, I started to to shoot up. But you know, even at that age, I um, I, I spent a year as a goalkeeper uh, at Inglewood Kiev, Inglewood United. Now, where my my dad was coaching, um, I played first team at Kingsway Olympic. I think I was seventeen, um, but I was also playing on a Sunday afternoon amateur Premier League for Maccabee as a striker. Um, so I just so much experience and so many different uh, things to take on board that you know, looking back, I was just learning the whole time, different positions, different things, how to how to go about your football. Um, and then, yeah, from Sorrento was probably the, the, the final step. Had a had a good first year back in there as a, as a first-team player. And then the arrival of um, Trevor Morgan, who came over from the UK, just that was my driving force of taking me to the next level, the professionalism, the, the desire, the hunger that you had to show in each and every training session, each and every game was, was then the thing that uh, I suppose helped me get to, to be a pro footballer. I mean, Gareth spoke a lot about playing lots of different sports um, with his brother when he was younger. And uh, from your perspective, Jamie, as you touched on before, you played a lot of different positions when you were growing up. And I know this is one of the big focuses now with coach education is not having players choose a position when they're so young. Cause I, I guess the great irony of your career is that you spent a lot of it even at Perth Glory as a centre back, but suddenly once the A League came around uh, and Glory were a bit light up top, you actually were top goal scorer at the top level for Glory for a couple of years as well. How significant was playing all across the field for you when you were younger in making you, yourself a more flexible footballer once you hit the top level? Yeah, it's a good question. I think with the all sports stuff, you know, we're starting to now realise that it's just simple movement patterns across every different sport that are fundamental to playing football um, and that aren't developed solely by playing football. And I, I think we moved away that from that for a fair amount of time and the uh, the 10,000 hours um, of perfection came in and distracted people from that. Um, so that's certainly something we're trying to incorporate into our training programs, if nothing else, is those different types of movement patterns. But yeah, playing playing in different positions gives you different problems to, that you've got to solve as a player. Um, again, you, you're not consciously making decisions; it's a it's an unconscious learning process. But you know, you think back, and I wonder if I would have been as successful as a striker for Glory if I hadn't spent time as a as a striker in the amateur leagues, if I hadn't played in goals um, and got used to reading play and organising things as a as a centre half. So, it, there's certainly something for me. I think from you know. From my junior career, I was a I was a flying right winger when I was a kid. Then a, a slower right midfielder, right back, sweeper, centre back, goalkeeper. Uh, I just don't see the point in in putting players into set positions because they won't get exposed to enough to be able to to adapt themselves to demands later in the game. And you look at players today, and geez, there's not too many probably centre halves aside that aren't uh, interchangeable with other positions. And it's a point that you can sort of get across to players as well when they miss out on a, on a trial or they're not playing in the position that they want to play when they're younger. Uh, there are so many players, and you're an example, obviously, uh, if you look to England, a, a guy like Jamie Barty, examples of players who maybe don't stand out at a younger age but do really impressive things once they are able to get to the top level. That's right, and development's a pathway. You know, when state teams are chosen, and I did make a state team as a kid and had some fantastic players, uh, Michael Garcia, Johnny Carboni were my age and, and brilliant players. Um, but I just wasn't good enough at that age. There, you know, there was no two ways about it. And I, and I look back now and, and can completely reconcile the fact that, that I wasn't. Um, but as you continue along and, and you get older and you actually start to reach your potential physically um, and then there's the, the mental considerations and I'll, and I'll think back and you know you think that maybe that that experience of, of not making a state team not making it past the first round of trials in some instances yet going back out the next day or the next week and starting to kick a ball around there's some you know there's some mental toughness and resilience that was perhaps built up in me in, in those days to be able to handle um, more and more pressure, more and more um, knockbacks and, and criticisms as, as I got older and as, my, as I progressed through the levels.
This episode of the Western Ed Podcast is brought to you by Football West's proud partner, Hyundai. They support the talent support program across Perth and regional WA, the girls, NTC, and a whole range of other great community football initiatives. Supporting our community and grassroots football journey. All day, every day, WA. Going back to you, Gareth, once you've left AIS, um, you come back into a system where I know the dream was there for, for many years for Perth to get a team at the National League level, but there were so many roadblocks. Uh, I think you went to the AIS in the mid-80s and um, Perth Kangaroos of the Singapore League, they're not around until uh, 1994. Uh, Perth Glory don't come into the A-League until 1996. What was it like for you over that time, I guess, waiting for the opportunity to represent a Perth team in the National League? Um, look, I, I think um, back then, Western Australia were ambitious to be a part of the uh, national competition. And obviously, yeah, I, I agree. It, it, it was difficult to achieve that. Um, obviously, Perth Glory, uh, Perth Kangaroos, especially for Nick Tana, um, um, obviously provide a platform for, and a springboard to get into the NSL. And I, and I think, to be honest, there's... And also, obviously, Football West back then and the support uh, they gave fo- uh, football to to create this team to um, possibly uh, move forward into the NSL. I think without that was definitely the the catalyst or tipping point in uh, to to make that pathway clear for a uh, a Western Australian team in uh, the NSL. Um, you know. Th- the local competition for a long time has been very strong in regards to um, uh, sort of pre uh, Perth Kangaroos. Um, the competition has been very strong, um, and I think it's uh, it's a long time coming for the uh, uh, for that acknowledgement and to move forward through the Perth Kangaroos into the NSL competition. Um, and as a player, obviously you always want to be challenged at the highest level um, and um, I think it was important for us to, to make that step through the Perth Kangaroos into the NSL. Uh, and, and in that season with the Perth Kangaroos, a bit of a watershed for you. You win the, uh, the Player of the Year award by something like 15 votes. My memory's not that good, to be honest. <laughs> it must be my age. <laughs> um, but, look, I, I think people forget as well that during that time of the Perth Kangaroos, you know, a lot of clubs as well made sacrifices in regards to allowing their players to compete in this competition for the bigger picture of becoming or being a uh, um, a stepping stone into the NSL. So, you know, um, Western Australian football came together to allow this to happen, uh, which is really important to acknowledge. Um, and a lot of people did a lot of hard work for for the game to uh, progress forward into this area and, and we shouldn't and it's important we acknowledge that because uh, you know uh, that's important and it's uh, it's nice that um, in Western Australia people come together for the good of the game to do the right thing uh, for the game which sometimes can be fairly rare at times so um, a lot of people should be congratulated in regards to, to that step. You did have a, a brief stint over in Adelaide. Did you ever think of leaving WA on a more permanent basis to chase your dreams? Look, I think you always always think about, you know, challenging yourself, trying to get better. Um, of course, I, I, I think it's, it's in my nature. I, um, I've probably done the same in coaching as well, um, to, to try and get better, challenge yourself, improve yourself, make a contribution. Um, you know, and I think football is a little bit like that as well. Uh, people are always chasing their next step, um, their next contribution. Um, uh, the way I am is that you know um, I'm similar. I'm, I I want to get better. Um, I want to uh, challenge myself, and sometimes you know it fails. Sometimes it doesn't, um, and and. I think that's the process of being involved in any type of sport. 
And, and for a younger player up and coming, once Glory was in the league, obviously it gave them something to to target it and to aim for. From, from your perspective, Jamie, once Glory was there, did it make that pathway a lot clearer for you as a player who was maybe uh, 17, 18 when they started? It did. Uh, there's no doubt about that. You know, before before then, you either had to go over east as as Navesy did, or or was to the UK. Um, there, there, you know, for for me as as someone from British heritage, or, or go to Europe, there there was nothing else in between to to do. So, you know, the start of of Perth Glory and the Kangaroos to, before then sort of gave local players a little bit of hope. Um, you know, I had travelled to, to England and had trials over there. Um, I think I was 17 or 18. Um, and that, that opened my eyes a bit to what it took to be a professional footballer as well. That, you know, the sacrifices and the, the dog-eat-dog world that it was um, over there at that time and probably still is. But certainly for that um, that vision, that, that local um, opportunity to do something in front of family and friends, to, to have that pathway was a, was a huge move forwards um, and something that I'd hoped I'd be a part of. Um, you know, when Glory first started, I was, I would have been then 18, uh, 19. I, you know, certainly wasn't ready. I had a decent first season in the top league, the second season. Um, again, did well and was, was hoping to be to be in there, um, but wasn't to be until um, obviously Bernd Stanger took over. But it was, it was certainly something that you could then aim towards rather than it just being a, a pipe dream of, of having to leave friends and family and go pursue your, pursue a career every, uh, elsewhere. Uh, Jamie, when, when you first came out to Glory, would you, you would have come across uh, Navesy either in local comp or in uh, sort of representative games against Glory before then? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, like, like Navesy, I'm struggling to recount the exact ones, but you, you always knew um, what you get from Navesy was, was, a, was a wholehearted, performance who he wouldn't um wouldn't you know cut any corners if there was a, a tackle to be won then then you know you were going to be going to be in for a you know for a clattering if the ball was there um and then and, you know one of the big things that I, I remember standing out when I did go to glory and, and you know I started with a two-week trial before I was signed was that uh you know he was he was one of the players that made me feel welcome um there was some fantastic fantastic footballers uh you know john markoski had just been signed uh kombutzianis uh yeah danny hay troy help and ernie tapai was still there um when i arrived um but but nazi took the time um as a couple of the other players did to to make a young you know pretty overwhelmed kid um feel welcome uh simply on trial let alone having signed so so that was you know that just speaks about about nazi's character but on the flip side of that you know it, it was no nonsense in training, in, in everything. He wanted to win at everything he did. Um, you know, running three kilometre time trials. If, if someone started to creep up on Navesy and get on his back, it was just a incentive for him to, to push himself harder and further. And and that was, uh, you know, he was a captain who led by example. And, and that certainly carried uh, the club on for those first few years. Ben Stunger, um, such a huge figure in West Australian football, so charismatic, fantastic with the press, fantastic with the fans, but also a, a bit of a reputation tactically as a renegade or a maverick. He played with very attacking teams. What was it like having a, a coach that ended up having such a, a huge a huge position in West Australian football as your first coach at the professional level? Well, I mean, for me, I was playing professional football. So I'd, I'd gone from training twice a week um, with Sorrento to training and playing every day with fantastic players, with great people as well, um, not just fantastic players. So, you know, whatever, whatever we did was a dream for me. Um, he was... Stanger was such burnt with such a confident, encouraging. He was a motivator more so than than probably a lot of other things. And it, you know, before a game, he'd come to me, Jamie. You go score today. Don't don't worry about defending. Someone else will do that for you today. You you just make sure you go and score. Um, and so, for a young player to have that have that confidence put in you to to actually have, you know be playing in the first place ahead of um, a Danny Hay or a Gavin Wilkinson or, or players like that um, meant meant a lot to me. Um, yeah, the, the, look, the training reflecting back was was similar of the training that a lot of clubs probably did back then, and 
um, was, you know, you, you got told what to do either by the coach or the players and, and I wasn't questioning because I was still learning the game. So it's probably Navesy who, as a more experienced player, might have a, a slightly different slant on, on what was that was like. I think Jamie's pretty much spot on, you know. What he did do really well is he definitely managed the crowd, the expectation, the perception. He put the, the state on the map in regards to um, the state's football ability. Um, you know, the type of game we play in Western Australia, the style. Um, and like Jamie says, gave players confidence to, to you know, express their strengths in regards to the, the players that he had. More so had the ability to run the game for him in a way that, that helped him. Um, but his management style and his media were definitely his strengths to bring the game to the rest of the country, I think, from Western Australia point of view. So the Ben Stunger era really crescendos with the 2000 NSL Grand Final. And it's really one of the most incredible games in Australian domestic football history, possibly not for the right reasons for yourselves, Dave C and Jamie. Jamie forced his way into the team during the 98-99 season, foreshadowing his future taste for big game moments by scoring a memorable headed goal in the elimination final against Adelaide City in 1999, but Gloria Flatt in the preliminary final against Sydney United and get knocked out. The next season, Gloria firing in all cylinders and snagged the minor premiership by four points from Nick Theodorakopoulos's Wollongong Wolves, then beat them in front of a packed house at Subiaco Oval in the major semi-final when Ivan Ugic comes on Gareth and scores a golden goal in extra time. The grand final against the Wolves on June 11 is the big ticket item in town. More than 43,000 people come to watch and the anticipation is so crazy. At the time, I was eight and my family had been going to the games all year. We were at the semi-final and then to get tickets to the grand final, my dad had to win a contest on 6PR radio to spell Bobby Despotovsky's last name. Glory pile on three goals in the first half, then all hell breaks loose in the second and they go on to lose at home on penalties. Being out on the field during that game, Jamie, what was it like going into halftime 3-0 up against the Wollongong Wolves with the premiership within your grasp? Yeah, it was, um, you know, walking off on air almost. Um, it, it's hard to de- describe that that feeling because you, you knew that Wollongong were a good team. They, you know, Scott Chipperfield, Matty Horsley, um, Stuart Young, um, you know, uh, so many good players, like Les Polga going in goals, that we knew that the final wasn't won, but it was hard not, especially as a young player, not to get carried away with being 3 0 up. Um, and, and that was, you know, to, to go back out in that second half and, and the way it went, you know, you look back at that half time and think, were we, were we too complacent? Um, should we have? Locked down and and said no no let's you know three nils are left that that's all um, obviously Burnt was a positive coach and wanted us to go out and score more goals and and really put on a show um, and on another day you know that would have worked we had chances through the second half we could have gone four nil um, four one five one whatever it might have been so it's a it's a really tough one to look back on and and think what went wrong um, you know there were probably tactical decisions and substitutions that that Burnt made that. Uh, influence the, the course of the game as, as it does in any case. But, you know, as players, we still have to reflect back and, and, and think that we didn't do the job that we were paid to do. Um, you know, we, we should have won that game. There's no there's no doubt about that. But it also was a, a, a seminal moment for the club and a spurring on that everyone remembers that game. You know, the number of people that I've spoken to, the crowd should have been 80,000, not 44,000. That's, that's how many people seem to have been there. And, you know, it will always... You know, as much as as it hurt at the time, and it still rankles that that I don't have an extra NSL championship under my belt to be involved in. You know, perhaps one of the greatest grand finals of all time in this country um, goes in some way to making up for that. All right, so we just got to uh, the end of Jamie's first reflections on uh, on the two thousand NSL grand final. Uh, you started the game and, and spent a lot of um, regular time in the game on the bench, Gareth. What was it like watching the game from the bench and probably for the first um, portion of that game, maybe wishing that you were out there? 
Well, you know, first half 3 0, I'm sitting there going, geez, yeah, he's made the right choice here. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, I think the first 45 minutes, the boys were very, very good. Um, you know, and obviously half time come around and, you know, um, and no, no doubt everyone thought that, you know, at that stage, you're looking at picking up the trophy. Um, and like James said, uh, Wollongong had some very, very good players. Um, and fair play to them. They, they worked really hard to, to come back into the match. You know, it's probably been opportunities where we could have pushed ahead at times within that second half. Um, I just think it creates history for the club. And like James says, it's, it's a great talking point And people remember that about Perth Glory, um, about the, you know, the crowd that were there, um, football being on the map in this state. Um, so it pre presents a lot of positives as well as, obviously, for the players, a lot of disappointment. Um, so I look at it as, uh, you know, what a day. Um, obviously, it didn't go our way. Um, there was a lot of ups and downs as, you know, you're on a roller coaster ride of, you know, won it, not won it, won it, not won it even through the penalty stages. So, you know, uh, great memories. Um, and uh, like uh, Jamie said, uh, um, you know, it would have been great to have a medal. Um, at the end of the day, it wasn't meant to be. And now we're here talking about it again, which is probably a really good thing because it's an important part of Perth Glory's history. And... Uh... The first goal for Glory, uh, Bobby Despotovsky uh, sort of rounds the goalkeeper, puts it in. The second goal is uh, Lubro Milicevic with a header. The third goal just before um, half time, Scott Miller flips the ball out to Troy Halpin on the left hand side. He takes a touch inside and knocks it up to the back post. Jamie Homel climbs above his marker and slams it in. Bern Stunger turns to the crowd, two fists raised. Uh, almost certainly the, the iconic image of the sport in WA up to that time, or at least it definitely would have been if uh, the results had gone another way. What was the feeling like scoring that goal at the time, Jamie? Oh, it was huge. Uh, it's, yeah, you know, the, the hairs on the back of your neck stick, stick up just thinking about it. Um, it, and you know, going through the minds, you can talk about Burnt Stanger going to the crowd. That's where I was going. You know, it was two arms up, um, a big, big pile on from what I remember. And you know, the, the things that come on, we've done it, we've done it. it. That was, you know, three nil up in a grand final. You, you you do think those things, but the you know that that feeling to to score in a grand final um, as a what would have been twenty two year old, I think um, at that stage, maybe just turned twenty three, was. Um, yeah, something something I'll always remember. Something I'll I'll always cherish, regardless of the game. Um, <laughs> scoring the penalty in the penalty shootout, even it was the worst contact I'd ever made on a penalty, um, was something I was proud of as well. With you know, with so much pressure and and Gareth the same, putting a hand up to take a penalty um, in in that sort of situation is, is something that you know is is a difficult thing to do, and and you do it because you trust your teammates and and you want to do well for them, but. Yeah, as as Nasi said, the whole the whole day was just is is almost a blur, just of of raw emotion, um, roller coaster walking out onto the field with forty four thousand people screaming. Um, yeah, for all the way through to, to losing the game, it, it you know you'd never have a rush like that anywhere anywhere else uh, outside of a sporting field. I think just uh, just before the penalties, recounting that second half. Uh... Scott Chipperfield turns uh, Ivan Ergic uh, and um, puts uh, Edgar Jr. I think uh, on his on his backside for Wollongong's first goal, and they get a sniff of the game. That's in the fifty sixth minute. Uh, the second goal, there's a, a free kick. It sort of squeezes underneath the wall, and, and Matt Horsley pops up, and then uh, Gareth, you've come on in in the eighty fourth minute for. Ivan Ergic, what was the brief for you at that time? Jeez, mate, you're pushing me now, aren't you? Wow. <laughs> Kick it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know what? Coming on at, at that stage of the game, 
it, obviously the most important thing is is try to get up to the speed of the game quite quickly, you know. And you know, as as a coach, from a coaching perspective, you know, it's how do you control momentum and hope? Hope's a powerful thing, you know. Scoring one goal, scoring two goal, you know, how do you control that as a player in regards to individually and as a as a team? Um, and 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 back then, you know, I think. As players, it's it's really difficult to, to do that unless you know how to do it as well. So um, I suppose when I've come on, I, I don't know how to control hope or, 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 you know, dismantle a team that scored one goal and two goals, you know. How do we do it? Um, and, in, in, and if I had my time again, if I, you know, there'd be certain strategies you can put in place that, that stop hope of the team. How do you, you know, stop the momentum? So um, I wish I knew the things I did now uh, as a coach and as I would as a player going to that pitch that day because, you know, uh, the biggest challenges for players and coaches in these situations is, you know, how do you stop momentum from a team? And, and that day, uh, they had a massive amount of momentum from one goal two goals, three goals, and, you know, at 1-0, there's a, a glimmer of hope. At 2-0, you know, there's a there's a lot coming. And then 3-0, um, you've actually pretty much, you know, destroyed the opposition in, in their their belief that they could be picking something up, you know. So, um, you know, I suppose it's like a tennis player coming, you know, 5-0 up, but then loses 7-5. In, in the final set or, or goes to a tiebreaker. So, um, you know, uh, back then I didn't know what I was thinking, to be honest. Go on, make sure one goal ahead or two goals ahead, keep that distance as long as you can. And I suppose mentally get ready for penalties if you've got to take one. And if you've got to take one, you make sure you score. So Paul, Paul Reed scores the equaliser in the 89th minute. It goes down... Uh... To some extent, it goes down Jamie's side of the field as well. It was a um, not some extent. Paul goes did. out to Paul Reader. I think uh, <laughs> Jamie misses a header on the way through. In terms of when you look back at the game now, as coaches, uh, both of you are pro license coaches. Has it had any influence on yourselves as coaches looking back at that game? And do you look at what you know now and think, "Oh, is this what Burnt and Mitch could have done differently?" I think there's there's definitely an impact as a coach because you've been in that situation. Um, you know, if you, you're getting to a grand final or semi-finals, you're losing games, you're winning games. You know, Navesy and I have had the opportunity to to actually experience experience that, um, experience you know the joys of of the whacker ground the year before and and winning games uh, all the way through to to losing. Uh, and we lost to Sydney United the year before, and we were, we were one game away from the grand final, and that sort of gets forgotten about a little bit. Um, but then, yeah, it's getting to the grand final, the, the, the huge positive of the, the major semi final, the golden goal that we scored, um, and then dropping back down again. So I, I think that certainly uh, helps when you're dealing dealing with players. Um, I think there's, there's probably another question in there as well, Nosey, and something that I've never spoken to you about, and I'm not sure you have, but. You know, as a captain, uh, you know, not being not starting uh, in that game, you started the, the major semi final. I think you're taken off at half time because you've been booked early on. But you know that that conversation that that Burnt had with you, and you know when was that? How how that happened, and and how that has probably shaped you as well. Yeah, look, um, look. Obviously, every player wants to start in the game. You know, if, if you don't want to start, something wrong with you. That's for sure. Um, but on that on that particular day, you know, he, on the day of the match, he, he pulled me aside and says, "You're not starting." It's simple as that. And I suppose you take it two ways: you uh, you sulk or you get around your teammates because they've got a really important job for the team to to deliver. Um, so I think it's quite simple: a supporter or don't. And um, you know, I think it was important that you know you need to support. Um, it's as simple as that. Um, I think it's as blunt as that, to be honest. Uh, so, uh, whatever disappointment you've got to, that you have at that particular moment, you've got to hide it. And because at some stage you may be called upon to perform, do your job, help your teammate, 
contribute, whether it's 30 seconds or whether it's 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. So your frame of mind better be ready. Um, so I suppose that was my focus is if, uh, if I'm called upon, well, make sure that you don't embarrass yourself and you, uh, you know, do what you're expected to do. So, you know, um, that, that, that's how, you know, and I won't be the first, I won't be the last to, to uh, for, for it to happen. It happens, you know, all the time, every time. In, in football, it's part of the game, you know. Picking players, not picking players, but going back to what, what you said, Jamie, about um, the experiences you have enable you to learn. It's, it's a massive... Um, way for footballers, for coaches to learn and uh, acquire that knowledge and make changes because you're learning from that experience. Um, and, I, and I think that our young players from the ages of five all the way through, um, we've got to make sure we put them in uh, different experiences so they learn and we repeat it as many times as possible. Um, and the game is a wonderful learner of those experiences, you know. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, it definitely prepares you in regards to what you need to do if this happens again, um, which, uh, you know, um, I uh, have thoroughly learned from it, that's for sure. Do you think that it's made it easier for you as a coach to make big calls like that when a, a big game comes about um well you know we, we yeah i think so i look at big calls I, I i think you know they're big calls in regard to it's important to players every call to a player is important to them you know um whether it's the position they play the number of minutes they have everything's important to the individual and it's you know um and it's important that I know as a coach, I've tried to be honest and transparent in in, in those sort so called big calls. But I think they're not so much big calls. I, I think they're just calls that are important to players. You know, every call that as a coach to a player or every conversation or communication you have with them, it's really important to them because it impacts them on so many different ways. So. Um, if, if what I've learned in regards to as a player to a coach and a co coach to a player is that, you know, um, it's really individualised. The individual player is so important um, and everything's important to them, you know. So um, yeah, it's definitely what I've learned a lot in regards to moving into coaching and, and, and obviously helping players and communicating to players. And Glory uh, eventually do win the big one in 2003. By that point, Gareth, you're retired, but Jamie, you're still out there and you scored the opening goal uh, against Olympic Sharks in the 2003 final at Subiaco Oval, which is uh, uh, one of the big moments in the game. Another big moment is uh, Stan Lazaridis uh, doing the toss wearing a, a Matrix cosplay outfit. Um <laughs> But certainly that that game would have uh, put to bed a, a lot of the negative memories you may have had if you, you'd never won one out on the field. Yeah, well, that was, that, you know, that was third time lucky. Um, we'd been beaten the year before by, by Olympic in a, in a pretty forgettable grand final, I think, all round 1-0, uh, apart from uh, Ante Milicic, who scored an absolute screamer the rest of the game. was It was a pretty poor one. So there was a, a great belief and a, and a great, Hunger, I suppose, in the squad to ensure that it didn't pass us by again. Um, you know, obviously, I think a, an early goal or an early-ish goal was was important um, because Olympic had set up to, to defend, to frustrate and to try and catch us on the break. So to be able to get a goal and, and get them to, to come out at us a little bit more was was hugely important. Um, and it's, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's another goal in a grand final. I'm thrilled to, to be able to, to score. Um, you know, you don't, don't think of that until afterwards, I suppose, about what it means personally because it, it, it's all about the team. But it's a nice, uh, nice thing to have to have scored in a couple of grand finals. It's it's something I look back on with a, with a great deal of pride. Um, but again, wouldn't have been possible without 
you know, the ball getting forwards in the first place. Uh, Simon Klosso delivering a great quarter, you know, exactly where I wanted it to be. So um, it, the, the whole experience, the occasion was just, uh, I think Mish Avray called it a weight off the shoulders. It, you know, we had a choker's tag around our necks and all these types of things. But, you know, for the quality of players we had, um, for the quality of players that we had, had come before, um, it was it was a yeah a, a fantastic moment for the club uh, as much as you know the previous grand finals had built up the the uh, you know the, the story around the club geez it was so important to actually win one and and to do it at home as well so it was uh, yeah a fantastic occasion and to to finally claim uh, an NSL winners medal and, and be the champion of Australia was um, you know pretty humbling for for myself in front of my friends and family. You did mention Simon Colosimo. I guess a lot of people might not have uh, remembered that game as much as the 2000 NSL Grand Final, but Simon Colosimo has a, a really fantastic game. He's really calm in possession. He, it's basically a, a clinic in how to play that fulcrum role at the back of the midfield. Yeah, yeah he had a very good game. Um, you know, when, when they went to announce the player of the match, I, I actually found it hard to think who it would be. Uh, you know, just the... The concentration, I suppose, we put in, I thought, defensively, we were absolutely superb from Jason Pekovic. Um, you know, we had a back four, Shane Price, myself, David Tarkas, Scott Miller. You know, four, fan, you know, really good players who are just out and out defenders at times. And, and we scrapped, um, you know, Matt Horsley. You know, I don't know how many Ks he did up and down the line. You know, there's just so many good players. Uh, Andre Gumprecht, Damian Mori, Bobby up front. Um, you know, Simon had a really good game, but... Yeah, you know, I, I couldn't pick someone out of that to to give an individual award to. Obviously, they had to, but that was just a real demonstration of the togetherness that that squad had at that time, um, and and how much it meant to each other that everyone put in a massive shift. and And I think if you'd asked Mr. Avra and Alan Vest, then then they might have had a different answer than than Simon, and it might have been along my lines that you, actually you couldn't you couldn't award anything to anyone. And uh, we, we spoke a bit about Ben Stunger and his reputation for having very attacking teams out on the park. And I know at the time there was a, a big deal made about the distinction between him and uh, Mitch Davre, who uh, from the outside looking in, it appeared to be a, a lot more regimented and a bit more defensively minded. Was that the way the players saw it at the time? And now looking back again, as a coach, uh, do you learn anything from the way the team shifted from 2000, 2001 through to the latter years when you won your premierships? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, I, I loved playing under under Burnt. Um, as both Gareth uh, Nazi and I have said, it was it was a huge amount of fun. You had a confidence. Um, you could, you know, within reason, you could pretty much do whatever you wanted. If I wanted to try and go for a fifty minute fifty meter run up up front then then I did that and uh, you know I scored uh, Northern Spirit I think when we won the the minor premiership in that 2000 year uh, with the header at the far post because I'd made a, a run forwards from a from a left-handed center back position um, what I what I thrived I think on under under mission and Alan Vest can't be forgotten because you know his work on the training field was was absolutely superb and I learned so much was that especially as a as a defender as a center half your responsibility was to keep a clean sheet yours and the goalkeepers keep a clean sheet and that was you know really impressed upon me by both Mish and Vesti that um you know I was going to be an important part of the team moving forwards but your job was to stop the ball going in the net if you get if you can chip in with a couple of goals at the other end fantastic but you get us a clean sheet and Bobby and Damon Murray will get us goals don't worry about that um and that was you know I was still only 24 25 at the time and to be given that level of responsibility to do so uh, was huge. I probably, uh, looking back, took it on a little bit too much and became um, too much of a one-dimensional centre-half, if, if I'm being honest. But um, in terms of what you know that gave us in, and the results that gave us in, in two championships, and I look back on that time, you know, really, really fondly as, as uh, you know, probably the pinnacle of, of my career in terms of a club and, and club honours and, and uh, yeah, you know, being champions of Australia twice in a row. As a player, Navesy, did you respond better to coaches that gave you freedom or did you prefer a, a regimented style? Um, look, I, I think the type of player was a very task-orientated in regards to 
what the coach needed from me um, as an individual um, and uh, probably my contribution f f from the team point of view. So um, probably adaptable in regards to the, the type of uh, game we'd like to play, whether it's an attacking style or w whether it was more a defensive style for me in, in a particular way. So um, but probably adaptable in, in regards to what the coach needed and what the team needed. So uh, did I have a preference? Not really. No, the only preference I had when I was a player was to win games. No, I didn't really care how I did it. <laughs> Thank you for listening to episode one of the Western End podcast. There's plenty more in the pipeline from sports psychology to more elite coaches, some other hosts. We've got a bit more coming uh, with some bonus content from Jamie and Gareth on their thoughts on new development and where that's headed. Please subscribe on whichever podcast player you're using and also head to footballwest.com.au for the latest news on the game in WA, what we're doing while everyone stays home during COVID-19. You can submit your nominations for the Goldfield State Dream Team while you're there. Gareth and Jamie could definitely be in the mix there with uh, their storied careers. So keep safe and one day we'll see you back on the park. <laughs>